Welcome to the second lecture in the Robert and Russell Moody Lecture Series. Happy to see all of you here. We are very, very fortunate to have as our second lecturer, Paul Bloom, professor of psychology from Yale. Professor Bloom has an incredible record of publication, community service, academic awards, and um, I don't have time to give you the full list. It would take the rest of the hour. But I do want to mention one of his articles that I really like the title of, and I intend to read it at some point, called My Brain Made Me Do It. <laughs> He's also written How Pleasure Works, another book that's just out called Against Empathy. And tonight, he will be talking about Just Babies, The Origins of Good and Evil. And Paul will have the opportunity, give you the opportunity to ask questions after uh, his presentation. So uh, I know that some of you will undoubtedly have some probing questions to present to him. Now I'll give you back your mind. Me up there in the, in the back, wave if you can hear me. Good, thank you. Um, thank you, William, for your, your very, very kind words. And thank you all for being here. Um, I want to talk about the origins of good and evil. But I want to begin with a study with adults. And it's one of my favorite studies. It's done about um, 80 years ago by the psychologist Thorndike. And Thorndike was interested in what we value, what we like. And, um, and he used a method that people now use a lot, but he might have been the first to use this method. He simply asked people, how much would I have to pay you to get you to do something? And that's the way to measure, so what people want to do, or how much would you have to pay me? So he said, he had all these questions. He said, how much would I have to pay you to eat a worm? Okay. How much would I have to pay you, this was in the 1930s, for a man to walk down this, the, the, this Fifth Avenue in New York City, without a hat. Yeah. How much would, and, and so he had all these questions, and one of them was this. And I'm going to give you his answer, what, what his subject said. And I've taken these dollars, and I've turned them into contemporary dollars. So this is going to be the answer you would give. And I want you to answer this question in the privacy of your own head. How much would I have to pay you to remove one of your front teeth with a pair of pliers? So think about it for a second. Here's what Thorndike's subject said. On average, $74,000. Now, some of you are chuckling. Some of you would say, ha, I'd do it for 10. <laughs> some of you might be thinking, I have you know, no money in the world. The exact number doesn't count. It's a comparison I want to do. Because he also asked people, how much would I have to pay you to kill a cat with your hand? So answer that question in the privacy of your own head. Here's what Thorndike's subject said, $164,000. Now, again, some of you would say, there's not enough money in the world. Some of you would say, hey, I'll pay you. Um, but, but the point is that his subjects wanted twice as much money, twice as much money to do something which they would view as morally wrong than to do something which is disfiguring and agonizing. And this says something about our natures. And this was nicely summarized by Adam Smith, the great philosopher of the Scottish Enlightenment. So some of you might know Adam Smith from his book, Wealth of Nations, which founded the modern science of economics. In Wealth of Nations, Smith argued that, um, that selfish beings in a certain forms of, of market societies could give rise to things that benefit everybody. But some people get confused and think Adam Smith believed that we were, in fact, such selfish beings. And that nothing could be further from the truth. His first book was the theory of moral sentiments. He himself thought it was his better book. And in it, he begins with these words. However, 
How selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him. <coughs> that we often derive sorrow from the sorrow of others is, as a matter of fact, too obvious to require any instances to prove it. So this is a claim about human nature, about people. But there's another issue here, which is the issue I want to focus on. And it's the developmental question. We do care about others. Every human does to some extent. But where does this come from? Is this something that, that, that emerges through social influence and through our, our parenting, our parents and our teachers and our society? Or is it to some extent what we're born with? And this question has been posed many, many times. My favorite way of, of framing it is from the poet and writer John Barth, who writes, is man a savage at heart, skin or with fat, fragile manners? Or is savagery but a faint taint in a natural man's gentility, which erupts now and again like pimples on an angel's arse? <laughs> very, very Irish. Um, and um, so, you know, are we, are we naturally savages, or, or are we naturally something else? And savagery is something which, which emerges, but is not our essential nature. And different people have different views. This is my favorite Onion headline, a fake newspaper. Um, which summarizes how many philosophers and psychologists used to think about children and babies. Uh, the headline is, new study reveals most children unrepentant sociopaths. But I want to get you to take seriously a different view, held by Adam Smith's contemporary, Thomas Jefferson. So Jefferson, in a letter to a friend, writes this. The moral sense or conscience is as much a part of man as his leg or arm. It is given to all human beings in a stronger or weaker degree as force of members is given them in greater or lesser degree. So we're born with a moral sense, a conscience. Um, although, Jefferson immediately notes, it varies among individuals. And, and now, um, any modern day psychologist or neuroscientist say, yeah, all, all traits vary. All traits are heritable to some extent, show natural variation. And this Jeffersonian view, this Smith view of human nature is supported by developments in evolutionary biology and comparative psychology and evolutionary theory more generally. It was once, once thought that a reading of Darwin said, uh, nature is red in tooth and claw. That an understanding of, of biological evolution simply entailed that we'd just be endlessly selfish and care only for ourselves. But Darwin never thought that. And, Darwin, and the sophisticated uh, evolutionary biologists were always clear that the force of natural selection should, should, in fact, must lead to some degree of other regard. For instance, because others share our genes, so Darwin wouldn't have put it this way or because we enter in productive interaction with others. And biologists would call this kin selection, reciprocal altruism. But however you want to frame it, and we see this in the animal kingdom, it seems that some degree of altruism, compassion, kindness is part of nature. And, um, and this brings us to developmental psychology. So we know that the youngest of children react with pain and anguish when they see someone else suffering. You see this long before the first birthday. Early on, you see universally sharing of food and sharing of stuff and often soothing when someone else is in pain. In some lovely experiments in the 1970s, experimenters and parents would pretend to be injured, pretend to bang their, their knee or to be emotionally upset. And then they'd videotape uh, the responses of toddlers, and they find often toddlers would tend to approach and soothe them. I mean, another study along these lines was done uh, a few years ago by uh, Felix Varnikin uh, and Michael Tomasello. Well, what they did was they put toddlers in a room, and an adult would run into some sort of trouble. And the question is, what would the toddler do? And I want to show you a video clip from one of the studies. If we could shift the sound, please, to, the, to this. Example sort of moral behavior reaction. But there's been a revolution in developmental psychology involving studies of understanding what babies know. And it's been discovered through this revolution that babies have a rich understanding of the physical world and the social world. And more and more investigators have started to ask the question, 
do they have a moral understanding as well? So we're not asking now whether they're inclined to do good or to, to be in pain when someone else is suffering, but rather, can they tell good from bad? Can they make moral judgments? And um, so this motivated a series of studies I've done with my collaborators. This is my, uh, on the left is my, my Yale collaborator and spouse, Karen Wynn, and our graduate student, now Professor uh, Kylie Hamlin. And if we can get the sound again, I'll show you one of our studies. So you will be, imagine yourself in a position of a baby, and you will be seeing what's basically a one-act play with an innocent person, a good guy, and a bad guy. good guy and a bad guy, at least by adult lights. And the question is, which do babies prefer? Now, what you saw wasn't actually a real stimuli from our experiment, because uh, there are certain things that were different. Um, we, w when this gets popular press, that video went out, and parents and, and people wrote me tons of emails saying, you idiots, don't you know babies just like squares, or babies just like triangles, or babies like going to the right or going to the left, moron, you should lose your job. People are very unpleasant on the internet. Um, so, so because, because when you guys attack me, you could attack me in different ways, I will tell you that the identity, color, shape, and size of the character were counterbalanced. What that means is that if the good guy was a square for half the baby to be triangle for the other half and so on, if, the, if it was the, and then, uh, the, and when given the, the choice, the, experiment, the experimenter is blind to the character's identity, so she herself doesn't know who the good guy and the bad guy were. So she can't cue the baby, even unconsciously. And what you didn't see in the video was uh, in the actual study, parents are closing their eyes. Or they have a visor, so they can't cue their baby. This is what a choice looks like. And what we found was overwhelmingly 10-month-olds and 6-month-olds choose the character, which for the adult, would be the good guy. Um, now, when this work came out, it, it caused a lot of controversy. Uh, it got published in the journal Nature, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. But, but also people said, look, we have study after study. We have a lot of control studies and variation. And people said, reasonably enough, look, all your studies involve up the hill, down the hill, helping somebody up, pushing them down, and so on. Maybe, um, maybe there's something special about the hill paradigm. Thank you so much. So what we did in the subsequent years was we did several other one-act plays for the babies. And I'm not going to show you all of them. I'm not going to show you any data. What I'll do is I'll show you an example. And I'll let you yourself figure out who the good guy and who the bad guy are. And what we found was, no matter how we set up the play, there's like four or five options now, depending on how you count it. Babies were always drawn to the good guy over the bad guy. I said I wouldn't show any data, but I will show an example of a baby responding. Now, 
One question which comes up, which is a perfectly good challenge, is how do we know these preferences are moral preferences? Babies reach for or approach the one who's good, but maybe they just want to affiliate with it or want to get close to it. Um, that doesn't mean they're morally judging it as good, let alone morally judging the one that they avoid as bad. And so how do we know it's moral? This turns out to be a surprisingly difficult problem because philosophers are not clear, even for adults, what is the sort of smoking gun of a moral judgment as opposed to another form of judgment. But there is, a, a, there is something which seems to connect to morality, which has captured the interests of our lab. And I'll, um, and I'll introduce it with a story. About 10 years ago, this guy in London loses his cat. It was, uh, it was an outdoor cat, so it spends most days outdoor, but every night it comes in. And one night he calls for it and it just doesn't come, so he goes to bed wondering about his cat. So he goes outside that morning and he opens up his garbage bin to throw in some garbage. And there's the cat inside the bin. So he's very relieved, but he's wondering, how did the cat get into the bin? And then so, now it turns out London, as you might imagine, has cameras everywhere. And there's a camera facing the bin. So he gets hold of the footage. And this is what he sees. Facebook and says, does anybody know this person? Sooner or later, she's caught. Someone identifies her. And journalists show up at her door and say, we know what you did to the cat. And she's understandably flustered. They ask her, why did you do this? And in a moment, a terrible moment, she says, um, it was a split second of madness. I thought it'd be funny. And it's just a cat. Now, it's clear why the man would be upset at her. It's clear why the cat would be upset at her. But what's interesting is there was this public uproar where people wanted her dead. And she had to be, be put under police protection. And this, I think, says something about our moral system, which is that if we view something as bad, we want the perpetrator to be punished, even if we ourselves don't benefit from the punishment. So we decided to take that insight and go with it for the children. So, and, and we did various experiments. These were slightly older children, 14 to 16 month old, where we show them similar interactions. But this time, they don't get to choose a puppet to interact with or choose a, a, a little figure to interact with. This time, they reward or punish. And um, what we found was, overwhelmingly, they tend to reward the good guy and punish the bad guy. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes, they go beyond that. I'll just show you one little clip. I'll caution you, this is not representative, but I, I have always enjoyed this clip. So right now, I've made a case for the moral capacities of babies. And some people take this and say, look, we are fundamentally good in all sorts of ways. It's, it's morality. It, it's, that, that's the answer to the question I posed at the beginning. This is not my position. My position is, although we have impressive moral capacities from the start, we also have some striking limitations. And some of the limitations follow from the evolutionary arguments I gave before. Because from the standpoint of evolution, an animal that was indifferent to the fate of a stranger versus a family member, or even a stranger versus someone it's in frequent interaction with, those genes would not do well next to an animal who cared about the difference. If I love all children, and you just love your children. You put all your resources into your children. I distribute my resources to children in the world. Whose children are going to thrive? And what genes are going to thrive? It's a no-brainer from a Darwinian perspective. Moreover, when you look at small-scale human societies, you find that they actually don't have universal love for strangers. Um, this is Jared Diamond talking to the small-scale societies of Papua New Guinea. And he writes, for these societies to venture out of one's territory to meet other humans, even if they lived only a few miles away, was equivalent to suicide. Margaret Mead is famously enthusiastic about the lifestyle 
of so-called primitive people. He said that, she said that um, when it comes to matters of sex, for instance, they do it far better than the sort of, uh, you know, uh, stuck up and repressed Americans and Europeans. But when it came to their treatment of other people, she was kind of blunt about what they felt. Most primitive tribes feel that if you run across one of these subhumans from a rival group in the forest, the most appropriate thing to do is bludgeon him to death. And certainly when you look at young children, the immediate reaction to strangers is not a positive one. At a certain age, babies develop what's called stranger anxiety, which, not surprisingly, is anxiety in the presence of strangers, suggesting that a lot of this is hardwired. And there's a lot of research then that goes in a different direction of what I've been talking about. Not the sort of powerful capacities of babies, but the limitations of babies, and even the limitations of older children and adults. Um, so for instance, I, it's true. What I told you is true about the helping and the sharing. But what I didn't mention is that you get this in far greater proportion when, um, when the people are familiar. So for instance, I showed you that video. What I didn't tell you was the child and the adult had interacted before. When the study was replicated by a bunch of Stanford researchers, and they hadn't interacted before, kids don't help. And it gets worse. Let me tell you about some studies I've done with um, my graduate student, uh, Mark Sheskin, and again with Karen Wynn. We play a certain game with kids that sometimes, these are economic games. And so there's a kid. These are older kids, as you can see. And we play for poker chips. And the kids get to trade in the poker chips for, um, for toys later on. So they mean something to you. And we tell the kids, um, you have to make a choice. In this case, the kid has to make a choice between green and blue. And the way the choices work is, those, th the things in the box next to you, in the square next to you, come to you. Uh, and the things in the box far from you, the square far from you, go to some other kid who you'll never meet before. You'll never meet again. Some kid will come in later. So you're not going to, it's not a friend, it's not a classmate. They'll never know who you are. So in this case, for instance, the child has to con con contrast the green, where she gets one and the other kid gets one, with the blue, where she gets two and the other one gets, the other kid gets three. So we did all sorts of permutations. So one of the permutation is one, one versus two, two. What the notation means is one for the kid, one for the other kid, versus two for the kid, two for the other kid. Now, if kids are selfish, they should choose two, two, because they get two poker chips, not just one. And if kids are generous and care about others, want to make others happy, they should choose two, two, because two is more than one. And they choose two, two. So it means that they're paying attention. But then we did a bunch of other ones. And I'll show you the interesting ones. And I want you to sort of answer the question, think into your own hearts how you would respond, where, where it's pulling you. Um, imagine these weren't little one poker chips, but real money. Imagine they were, say, salaries of you versus other people. And the contrasts are 1, 1 versus 2, 3, and 1, 0 versus 2, 2. Now, at first blush, you might think, this is obvious. If kids are greedy, they should choose 2, 3 over 1, 1, because 2 is more than 1, and 2, 2 over 1, 0, because 2 is more than 1. If they're generous, they should choose 2, 3 over 1, 1, because 3 is more than 1, and 2, 2 over 1, 0, because 2 is more than 0. They should choose a bigger amount no matter what. But you'll notice something. It's true everybody gets more for 2, 3. But by choosing 2, 3, the stranger gets a relative advantage. Everybody gets more of 2, 2. But if you choose 2, 2, um, then you give up the relative advantage of 1, 0. For kids up until the age of like 8 or 10, this makes a difference. They choose the lower amount. So it's not that kids are selfish. It's much worse. It's that, it's that they're willing to sacrifice, to give up real resources in order to either maintain a relative advantage or not find themselves in a relative disadvantage with total strangers. Um, my best way of summarizing this is from uh, the author Kingsley Amos, who in one of his books, he has one of his characters say, it's no wonder that people are so horrible when they start their life as children. <laughs> and it's not just kids. So there's some lovely research done by uh, Franz de Waal and Sarah Brosnan. 
with uh, capuchin monkeys. And so capuchin monkeys, you have to know to understand the study. Capuchin monkeys um, really love, they, they like cucumbers. It's fine to reward them with a cucumber, but they love grapes. So here's the study. You, um, you get the, the, the monkey in a situation where it hurts. They're, they're taught to do something to get a reward. And that monkey, that's the experiment. That monkey gets a cucumber and gobbles it up. Hanging out there. But now it watches the monkey to its side get a grape. Now it hands over something and it gets a cucumber. <laughs> So our basic moral capacity, I think we have one. And I think it's interesting and powerful. But it's limited in certain ways. Limited, actually, in similar ways to the capacities of other primates. Limited in just the same way you'd expect it to be for creatures that have evolved through natural selection. But here's the puzzle. We're better than that. So this has been pointed out by many scholars. Peter Singer, for instance, has argued for what he calls the expanding moral circle where he points out that people in the sort of state of nature only care about their families and friends. And I think that's also our natural biological state in the state of ch young children. But we're not limited to that. We come to recognize that people in other human groups have a moral value. We come to realize that, uh, that morality extends to everybody on Earth and perhaps for some to non-human uh, to non humans People may have different views about the treatment of animals, but most people here would be appalled at someone who tortured a cat to death for fun. Because although the cat has no relationship to us in any Darwinian sense, it, it, it's a sentient being and shouldn't suffer. And we know that. And Steven Pinker recently has documented how over human history, um, violence has gradually declined. We are gradually becoming nicer to each other for all sorts of reasons. And um, so for instance, although it might seem we live in violent times, um, the 21st century is, by just about every way you reckon it, one of the, perhaps the most peaceful time to be human on Earth, the one of the most safest from, from predation. Um, so what, what makes it, what happens? I think there's a lot of answers to this question. But I want to focus on one, one that's particularly interested me, which is that what we have as babies is a set of sentiments and reactions. But what makes us interesting as adults and as older children even is we have the capacity for reason and rationality. And I want to frame this issue um, once again through uh, Adam Smith. And this is, a, Adam Smith gave uh, maybe 300 or so years ago a famous example. So he's writing to a European, a male European audience. He says, how would you feel if thousands of strangers died? And his example was, how would you feel if you heard that the great country of China was destroyed. This is most people, many people now may know Chinese people or be Chinese. Just imagine hearing from some country you haven't, you just don't really have any interest and don't know anybody yet, that thousands of people have died. Smith says that this educated man would say, well, that's such a pity. Someone should do something about it. How sad. And then go on to his everyday life. It won't move us emotionally. And now compare he was discovered that tomorrow he's going to lose his little finger. Well, he wouldn't take that as nothing. He wouldn't take that whole, who cares? He would be, which finger? How am I going to lose it? Why exactly me? And, and so on. He'd be anxious. And if you don't like these examples, use different examples. Every one of us in this world is regularly exposed to accounts of horrible suffering of strangers, the death of strangers. And, and the fact that we are here in this room as functioning people means it doesn't bother us that much. But many of us could be driven to a rage by missing a plane 
or a slow internet service. <laughs> so Smith's question is this. Um, actually, I don't have his question slide. His question is this. Since these personal things bother us so much more than the death of strangers, does this mean if we could choose, we would choose to have thousands of people die rather than lose our little finger? For the last time tonight, I'll ask you to answer that question of privacy in your own head. But Smith says we would not. Smith says that although um, we do care about strangers, they, don't really, they may not pull us emotionally, but we do care about them. And he says, well, why? And so this is from a man who up to this point has written a book all about the moral emotions, the sentiments, our gut feelings to help each other, empathy and sympathy and compassion. And he writes this. It's not any of those. It's not the soft power of humanity. It's not that feeble spark of benevolence which nature has lifted up in the human heart. Rather, it is reason, principle, conscience that calls to us with a voice capable of astonishing the most presumptuous of our passions that we are but one of the multitude in no respect better than any other in it. And this last part is often known by, uh, by philosophers and other scholars as a principle of impartiality. And it shows up in every religion and every, as in all the versions of the golden rule, and in every philosophy, whether you're a utilitarian who believes that the right is determined by adding up pleasures and pain, or, a, or you believe in moral principles of broad applicability, or you believe in John Rawls's theory of political philosophy, Every moral philosophy that is a moral philosophy accepts that although I love my own children infinitely more than I care about yours, still I have to recognize as a moral matter that my children carry no more weight. And um, my favorite example of this is not from a philosopher or a theologian. It's from uh, the Humphrey Bogart character in Casablanca. So, and I'm not going to do my imitation because I tried it once and it really didn't work. Um, but so, okay, so here's what happens. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to wreck it for you. But it's the end of the movie, and he's telling uh, uh, his girlfriend that they have to separate. Even though this is going to cause him pain, his girlfriend pain, and her husband pain. It's a complicated movie. Um, and here's what he, and she says, oh, no, no, that's too, I'm me too. And here's what he says. It doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. And that step, to appreciate that, I think it does take much. But, but that, is, that is the dawning of morality. That is a moral sense. And that's what babies don't have. That's a capacity absent in babies and young children. Now, um, as William said, I have a book coming out in about a month. Um, you could pre-order on Amazon, um, where, where I, I acknowledge that, that there's a duality in our moral lives right now, because we are capable of, um, of reason and, uh, and rationality. But at the same time, we are pulled by all sorts of emotions and biases favoring our own. Now, many, many of these biases are, are of the sort that, rash, that, that most of us would want to disavow like say strongly racist bias, biases, are biases to find attractive people more worthy than ugly people. But some are complicated. And, and, and I've argued, in this book, I argue a couple of things. And one of the things I argue is that even the sentiments that seem to be most precious and valuable, like empathy, empathy in the sense of feeling other people's pain, actually leads us morally astray. And the second thing I argue is um, that we are capable of overriding them. We are capable of the sort of Adam Smith type of rational deliberation. Now, not everybody is fond of either of these arguments. And tomorrow we have a seminar where we'll probably talk about empathy, pro and con. But many people are critical. Many people in my field, many philosophers and psychologists, are critical of rationality, particularly social psychologists. So um, my friend, uh, Jonathan Haidt, wonderful scholar, has a book, The Righteous Mind, where he argues that we think we're rational beings, but actually we just use our rationality 
to, um, to justify moral conclusions we've come to in other ways. The metaphor he uses is, we think we're like judges looking over a case and coming to a decision. But in fact, we're more like lawyers having a case given to us, and now we have to argue for it. Franz de Waal, the primatologist whose work I discussed before, puts it even more bluntly. He writes, we celebrate rationality, but when push comes to shove, we give it little weight. Now, I think they're both largely mistaken. And, we could, and, and if people want to defend them, we'll have an interesting discussion. I want to leave a lot of time for questions and discussion. Um, but let me just briefly tell you a couple of ways why I think they're mistaken. It may be true that for most people, for most of their lives, our moral views are swayed by our gut feelings, by how we're raised, by our innate proclivities. But I think for most people, I think for all people, there's at least some of the time where we're not limited to that. And um, my favorite examples are at extremes. So if somebody has the same moral beliefs as everybody around them, you vote the same as your neighbors. Your opinion on gay marriage or abortion or whatever is the same as your neighbors and your parents and your friends. Then we can't tell whether you came across it rationally or whether you simply absorbed it, like you may absorb your style of dress or your accent. But what's interesting as a psychologist is people who zig when everyone else zags. So, um, so there are some colleagues of mine that study uh, children who, who everybody around them eat, eats meat. And they say, I want to be a vegetarian for moral reasons. There are people I know who, um, who would, do not fly because of concern for global warming. When invited to a conference, they go in through Skype or some other way. I am obviously not one of them. Um, and there are people who, um, who give up their lives, lucrative jobs, the chance for personal luxury and personal wealth to, um, to, help, um, to help needy people. And when you do a Google search for needy people, you get that guy. Um, and those are extreme cases. And you're thinking, I'm not like that. But what I will suggest is that for each one of us, there are times when we have to mull over our moral problems. And the moral problems that we mull over typically, I think we get deceived because we tend to think in terms of the sort of things that end up big, big ticket items, like abortion, death penalty, gun control, that are highly politicized and highly caught up in your group affiliation, who your friends are, what political party you're a member of. The moral deliberation, I think, which is more interesting, and which not enough philosophers explore, and not enough psychologists explore, is the moral problems of everyday life. You know, um, I lent my brother-in-law money, and he's not returning it. What should I do? Is it right for my friend to, to date so soon after her husband died? Um, there's a kid I think is being bullied, and his parents don't seem to care. Should I talk to the school principal? And what's interesting is people don't reflexively respond in these cases. They mull it over. They talk with friends. They argue. If you go to, um, if you go, if you see humans in their natural habitat both humans like us and even small humans in the playground, they will argue and debate and discuss. And a lot of what they argue and debate and discuss uh, concerns moral issues. And so, oops, wrong direction. Also, what we often do with our rationality is our rationality may not directly affect um, our behavior. But often, we can use our rationality to put into place mechanisms to constrain ourselves. Constitutions are a good example of that. Laws in general, but also constitutions. So the, the US Constitution says that no matter how much you might like a president after two terms, you can't shoot just because you want to reelect him or her for a third term. No matter how much white Americans may want to reinstantiate slavery, they can't. They can't put a new law to do it. The Constitution is what philosophers call a self-binding mechanism, where you put into place things to stop your worst impulses from, from, from take, taking play. More everyday example of this is the mechanisms people use to avoid bias. So for a lot of cases in life, you are biased when choosing to hire somebody. I'm not allowed to choose to hire uh, researchers in for my lab if my son applies, because 
correctly, I'm too biased. And the solution isn't, oh, don't be biased. The solution is to set up a procedure where I, my biases can't come into play. Or take another example, and this final example. Um, it used to be that women, that men were overwhelmingly chosen for symphony orchestras. And they would audition, and they would get the job. And judges, both male judges and female judges, would say they, um, they just sound better. The men, the men have stronger technique. It's the way it is. It turns out that this bias largely goes away when people audition behind screens. And, and what that is is a low-tech way of using our intelligence to override our gut feelings. It is, I think, a waste of time to say, oh, I'm not going to be sexist. I'm not going to be racist. I'm not going to be biased towards attractive people. We are horrible at that. But we are also smart enough to construct social institutions that when we see an emotion or a bias or a proclivity as wrong, we can work to set up systems to, um, to, to block it. Um, I'm sometimes asked whether, um, whether we are naturally good or evil. And I think the best answer is yes. We are, we are I think there's, there's, there's evidence for a surprising fact about people, which is that we are born with capacities for uh, uh, kindness and compassion, and even with some rudimentary capacity to judge right and wrong and to appreciate justice and fairness. But these capacities are limited, and they're sharply limited, even tragically limited. Unfortunately, what we also have are other things that, 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 that develop through our lifetime that make us better people. Capacities like, um, like our, um, our kindness, our imagination, and our extraordinary capacity for reason. And I'll stop with that. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, you way in back. So the question was about the experiment is toddler opening up the doors for the man. And what does the toddler think when, when, when he's doing it? Does he know he's doing something to help the person? And it's a great question. They do all sorts of other methods suggesting that the toddlers will only act in this way if they, come to believe, if they have good reason to believe it will help the person. So it's not merely that they like opening doors or they like certain behaviors, but rather they do seem to do it pro-socially. Now, one could be, following up on your question, um, one could be skeptical as to whether there's a genuine moral motive here or a reputational motive. The kid is not alone. While the mother does not prompt the kid, it's possible the kids are either consciously or unconsciously trying to show off what good kids they are. And there's other experiments trying to pull those apart. Um, yes, and people can have to shout given the acoustics of the place. Yes. Oh, no way back. Any of you? <laughs> I'm just pointing vaguely. I'm uh, I'm nearsighted and uh, lazy. So, um, yes, the woman there who keeps doing this. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, you have to talk louder. How do they know which one's good or evil? If it's, does somebody, how do they really know? The, the dolls. Ah, right. So what, so that's a great question. So for all of our experiments, we have good guys and bad guys. But, um, but the question is, and we chose these by looking, by constructing ourselves. You say, well, stealing, uh, somebody who steals would be bad. Somebody who gives back would be good. Somebody who helps somebody out would be uh, good, someone who pushes somebody down, like that. But what features are babies looking for? And there's different answers to that. Nobody really knows. I think a large part of the story is going to have to do with the notion of goals. And that babies understand very early on, there's other research on this, that individuals have goals. Your goal may be to walk across a room unimpeded, or to drink some water, or play with a ball. Um, and that Good actions, pro-social actions, um, are ones that help assist the goal. So in another one of our one-act plays, we have a puppet trying to open up a box. And one of the characters comes and opens the box with them. The other character jumps on top of the box and slams it shut. 
And I think that what's good is helping a goal. What's bad is impeding a goal or stopping a goal. But I don't think that's all there is. Um, so for instance, some other research suggests that babies believe hitting is bad. Now in some way you could say, well, hitting's bad because we all have the goal not to be hit. I think that's kind of silly. I think they instinctively know at a very low level that physical assault towards another is a bad thing. And they think caressing or, tick or sort of patting is good. And that may have a similar low level again. Yes? I think that's a great question. Um, I actually see this work as. What was it? I was. <laughs> the question is to reconcile these findings with Piaget's views. That, that, that many people here are developmental psychologists or educators, and, and I see this project as um, very actually uh, amenable to a Piaget and our Kohlberg approach. The capacities that we find in babies and young children, both moral responses and the judgment capacities are over issues that Piaget had little to say about. He was notoriously uninterested in our moral proclivities and in the moral emotions. And he didn't have any say of these judgments and everything. Um, so for the most part, if, if, if he was sitting here, he'd be nodding and saying, oh, trivia. You know. um, and I'm also, he also though, was adamant that a moral philosophy emerged late. And this was an idea sort of developed by his colleague, Kohlberg. Um, and I think there, too, he's right. I, and, and so a lot of Piaget's critics have said, oh, we never develop a moral philosophy. We never think in a philosophical fashion of morality. But as you can tell, I disagree with them. I think Piaget and Kohlberg were right. Um, having been this amenable and agreeable, I will give one disagreement, which is that Piaget said that babies um, and young children until a very late age have no understanding of fairness and equality. And uh, there he's flatly mistaken. There are several other studies I haven't spoken about, for instance, that even a, a one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old, to be fair, uh, prefers a character who divvies things up two for you and two for you than three for you and one for you. And if, and if Piaget was here hearing that, he'd say, uh-oh. Yes. Um, what I've argued is that, um, so I didn't really frame it this way, so I'm glad you asked the question, but I think um, a lot of our mor morality, say, our capacity for compassion and care, our ability to make moral judgments, our ability to, um, to judge, to, to even to assess fairness and justice, is genetic. It's genetic in the sense that, um, that having eyes is genetic, or the ability to speak or babble is genetic. Now, being genetic means that it will admit of some variation. Having eyes is genetic, but some people have better eyesight than others. Um, as Thomas Jefferson would say, arms and legs are genetic. Well, no, he wouldn't have said that, but if, but if he was around now, he would say arms. What he basically was saying was arms and legs are genetic, and so you would expect the strength of arms and legs to vary. Being genetic is actually entirely consistent with showing variation. But the answer is yes. A lot of morality, I would argue, is genetic. But then, in the sort of second part of my talk, a lot of it's cultural. So the idea, for instance, that all humans have equal rights, is, or that sexism is wrong, is a cultural invention. Most, um, most humans never knew it. It is as much a sort of, I think it's a discovery, like the discoveries of science. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, periods of time than others. And 
so I'm thinking about uh, Stephen Pinker's book. Uh, I'm thinking about primitive cultures or isolated tribal cultures. I'm thinking about the hundredth monkey story. And I'm thinking about quantum theory, all which are kinds of ideas which um, influence research and conclusions. So uh, the developmental stage <coughs> of primitive culture, um, the conclusions of an evolutive condition, uh, that is to say, human beings becoming civilized, industrialized, and so on. The notion, the possibility of the hundredth monkey story, which is, you know, we simultaneously learn as if there was, a, some people would argue, a collective consciousness. Um, and then the quantum idea, which is, the, you, if you approach anything, you change it, or you influence it. So I don't know if, if you, if I'm communicating what, you know, what it is that I'm trying to communicate. But I think there's a jumble of things there that have to be reconciled, possibly. Uh, and what your thoughts on that are? I appreciate the question. Um, so one reason I appreciate it is it's a good reminder to think that when I, if I give this talk, if somebody gives a talk 50 years from now on the same topic, they'll say very different things. And some of the things I've concluded with confidence, they'll say, we don't believe anymore. Because it's, it's science. It's so, and so we get things wrong. We discover, or better still, we discover new ways of looking at things. We discover new explanations. Absolutely. Um, however, there are sort of different levels of, um, of uh, robustness. So some of the stuff you mentioned, in my view, and I think the way you're dreaming through, is kind of really out there. Like quantum theory, as I call it. You know, whatever. I, I, we, can, we might disagree whether this is really a cool direction or it's like a fad. Um, but, um, but then there's findings which are really robust. Like the, the hip, part of the brain known as the hippocampus is involved in memory. That, um, that the frontal lobe is involved in self-control. That babies know one plus one equals two, at least by the age of one year. That, um, you know, and long list of findings, which I would accept they could be wrong. It could be in the same sense that the moon could be made out of green cheese, but they probably aren't. What's more likely is we'll come to have new discoveries about the mind that will put these findings in a different light. So, um, so, but if what you're saying is that for everything I say, one should be skeptical, I think that that's true. It's true for everything. Did I, did I give, do justice to your remark? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, I'm always interested in how we look at the Senate conclusion without an excessive confidence, as if there is some way that something is, given that there is a proneness Well, I think some, some things are amenable to change and some things aren't. So um, the basic laws of physics aren't going anywhere anytime soon. However, the relationship between, you know, an aggressive foreign policy and, you know, and stock prices, who knows how that's going to change over history. So some things change a lot, some things change a little. The stuff I'm interested in is, if I'm right, subject to biological evolution, so it will change very, very slowly. I think a different way to look at it is we should always be skeptical. But the way to think about the skepticism, I would suggest, isn't in terms of their broad philosophical view. It's just in terms of data. So if someone tells you, like, here's a really cool finding, you know, such and so cures cancer or whatever, we should say, so has it been replicated? How many different labs have looked at it? Has it been peer reviewed? How much scrutiny? At the end of it, you're not going to get certainty. You're going to get relative certainty. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of like cold fusion and so on, and some guy proposes it, and nobody, nobody's looked at it yet, and everybody goes running for it. So maybe the better question would be, oh, I'm giving that study, have other labs replicated it? Um, you know, what if you change the method? What do your critics have to say? Has this been published in a peer-reviewed journal? And so I, I appreciate your skepticism, but I think in everyday life, you know, if, if I tell you I flew here on United, 
you could say, I don't believe you. And I say, well, I'll show you my ticket. You can make up your ticket. But at a certain point, I can really give you really good evidence. And that's the sort of way we should treat science as well. Yeah? So I appreciated you showing that uh, uh, capuchin monkey clip. I love that. So the, so the, the uh, response of the monkey when it got the cucumber rather than the grape, it was pissed. Because the deal was I was supposed to get a grape. So the question is, who was good and who was evil? The researcher? <laughs> <laughs> you get the effect, even though, so just as a minor point, but you get the effect even if that monkey, even if there was no deal. You also get it for dogs. Um, so if you take two dogs and they both do something and you give one of them a so so dog treat, another one an amazing dog treat, the one who got the so so dog treat will look at it, what the hell? Um, but to answer the core of your question, the experimenter is a jerk. <laughs> um, and what makes, what makes matters worse is me and my colleagues have done similar experiments with children. <laughs> Just with, they, they, don't, they cry. <laughs> no, 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 that, no, no. That, that'd be, uh, yes? So you go a bit, I heard enlightened self a bit louder, please. Right. Enlightened self-interest instead of the, the way they think of it now as greed is good. So his concept was it was good if it was good for everyone and not just for somebody who benefited. So I was wondering if your rational compassionism has to do with the size of groups possibly, the numbers of people involved. If there were smaller numbers, would it be more that they would be innate in their compassion rather than thinking about or, and is that why we need the, uh, for instance, the Constitution to uh, limit us? It's a good question. Um, and it goes both ways. So it's true that we have not evolved to live in large groups. The idea for most humans, through most of history, sitting in a room like this, surrounded by strangers, would be a nightmare, would be terrifying. Um, Sarah Hurdy, the anthropologist, says she sits in airplanes and full of strangers compacted together, hungry, bored, lonely, needing to pee. And, and she thinks that if this was a plane full of chimps, in seconds, there'd be blood on the wall. <laughs> They'd be just, just going crazy and everything like that. So there was something really unnatural. And in order to cope with unnaturalness, um, we need a lot of things like constitutions and laws and so on. But it also interestingly works the other way around. So Joe Henrich um, has done some wonderful stuff looking at different societies and asking, how nice are they to strangers? Hospitality is one thing, but how nice, would, it, that's a different story, but how nice are they to distant strangers? How much money will they give to a distant stranger? And, and he found that two main factors predict kindness. And as somebody, they're both surprises to me, but they both fit what you're saying. One is religion, which is that societies all human societies have religion, but some of them have these big gods, particularly Islam and Christianity, both big god religions. And if you're a member of those, those religions, all of a sudden you're in a community where a million people are your brother and your sister, and that makes you nicer. And the second factor is uh, engagement in free market capitalism. Because although you know, people have strong views over whether this makes you in ways that makes you good or bad, it does seem to enculturate you in having mutually beneficial interactions with strangers. And so if you find a small scale group where they have money and they do trade, they're going to be nicer than ones who don't. So there's a hand I'm not seeing. Oh God! Um, on, so 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 there's there's so much to say about about religion. So um, and honestly, the relation between religion and morality is truly a mess because there's all these contradictory findings. So we'll go back to the issue the man was raising before about being skeptical about research. And 
here's some things, some things we know. Within the United States, religious people are kinder than non-religious people. When it comes to giving to charities, excluding religious charities, like giving blood or giving to the homeless. Um, we know that when you give people moral judgment questions about their morality, about what they think is right or wrong, it turns out religion plays almost no role in determining them, outside of, of questions particular to religion. So remember I told you religion's good for America. It also turns out there's a very robust and powerful correlation. The more religious a country is, the worse it is in every possible way. Yes. Murder, rape, um, even things like, like teen pregnancies. Um, and so it's kind of a mess. And what I think is, there's some lovely work by the sociologist Robert Putnam. And he asked, so he went back to the first question and said, what is it about religion that makes people nice and give to charity in the United States? He had an enormous amount of polling data. And his finding was very cool. It turns out that a lot of his polling data was, you know, um, do you believe in life after death? What do you think of evolution? Do you believe in heaven and hell? Religious belief questions had no predictive power. The, what has predictive power is how often do you go to church or mosque or synagogue? And so his claim is that religion, and it's the same thing as the Joe Henrik claim I just gave you, that religion exerts its effect not through belief systems, but through community. It's why, it's why um, you know, uh, it's why Mormons are happier than Buddhists. It's because, you know, Buddhists, oh, they got this great philosophy, they're just sitting alone in their room, going, uh, and, well, well, you know, well, religious, no, no, sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm an atheist, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm really alone in my room. Um, but, um, but, and so the argument is that, that religion, that being atheist is very bad in a society like the United States because um, you're left out of the dominant social group that does moral things. Um, this predicts that if you're an atheist in a country like Norway or Sweden, you'll be fine. You'll be just as nice, which is true. So that's sort of a, a capsule answer to your very deep and hard question. Yes, you really will have to yell. Punishment an effective tool to increase just acts? Is, is punishment an effective tool in response to unjust acts? No, to, to increase, to enhance just acts. Um, one, that's a good question. One way to ask the, answer the question has to do with sort of as a tool for, for raising kids and doing societies and everything. And I don't know. That's just there's so much debate about that. But what does seem to be true is that from an evolutionary point of view, from every perspective, if you didn't have some sort of punishment, which could include shunning for being a jerk, then being a jerk would pay off immensely, and everybody would be a jerk. So the huge problem in evolution of morality has always been, why do nice guys evolve? When I could be a nice guy, I could evolve, but if you're a jerk, you'll get everything I got and more. What's stopping you? Why would my nice guy genes propagate? And the answer is because we also evolve in parallel mechanisms that punish bad guys. So that's separate from the question of how a good society should treat criminals or how a good parent should treat a misbehaving kid. But we know from evolution, the answer does seem to be yes. Punishment is essential to the evolution of morality. I'm, I'm sorry, I get, oh, my favorite video, oh, um, oh, God, um, I like the video of our experiment because it's mine. <laughs> yes.
and the men were in charge of hunting and the fish. And the men sat around, dressed up, well, they would get dressed up in their warrior kind of stuff when it was time to do that, but they sat around and mulled over daily, all day long, how they were going to pay back the guys who yeah. came and stole a pig, which was the biggest thing you could do. You can rape my wife, but if you steal my pig, you're in big trouble. But the men were in charge of that response. They were in charge of revenge, and, and to me, that was, they set the stage for morality. They said, here's, the, and that sort of led me to this, either I was going to ask this question or just tell you this long story, that morality... It's a, it's a great story. Keep going. Morality just really seems to be very normative. Yep. And when people came into Papua New Guinea and, and started taking their oil, the men were without jobs. Everything fell apart. Their civilizations pretty much, as they became, you know, by and destroyed by other people coming and changing their way of life. <coughs> the women still co took care of the kids and the pig in the garden, but the men really didn't hunt as much, and they just really weren't allowed to do revenge. Yeah. You know, somebody came and said, you know, you really yeah. shouldn't be doing it. That's not nice. And that left a really big impression on me. I'd like to hear your reaction. That's, that's interesting in so many ways. Um, Part of it goes back to the point made before, which is revenge has a bad name <coughs> in our society, as well it should. Um, but without some proclivity towards revenge, we'd never have morality in the first place. If there's no punishment for stealing the pig, we'll just steal the pig. <laughs> and right now we know better, but it, over evolutionary history, somebody who had the pig-stealing gene, that gene would win. And every, So you have to have somebody will do a payback. <laughs> without some sense of, without some punishment, um, you, you wouldn't have morality in the first place. Now, there's a lot more to morality than that, so I would give more credit to the, to the women in, in there, in your example. But it still has a large part of it. Now, what we do in a society like ours, to varying degrees, is we offload revenge to the state. You know, somebody steals my pig, I can't go to his house and blow his brains out. He will disapprove. I have to dial 911 or, or file a civil suit. And some of us find that very unsatisfying at some point. Well, and there's differences. Um, um, I think I'm living closer to a so-called culture of honor than in Connecticut, where, where, and there's actually a lot of data suggesting, even in the states, there's great regional differences in what you think of somebody who some guy insults his girlfriend and then he beats him to death. Where in, a, in, in some, some parts, it's, it's the worst, you should go to prison. Other parts, well, he shouldn't have done it, but it's understandable. Um, you're also right to point out that when it comes to morality, there are some sex differences. And you mentioned, I think, both of the interesting ones. Um, one is that, that the nurturance uh, and, and the kindness seems to be accelerated in women, presumably because of the evolved capacity for childcare. And the revenge has gone, the, the revenge and the moralizing um, is more of a male trait. Not to say that there aren't women who really want payback and who will, will, will kill you. But, um, but and in fact, so, and this could show up in simple ways. So here's the simple sex differences, which, okay, I, I, I broke my promise. I am going to ask you to do one more thing in the private view of your head. How many times in your life have you really wanted to kill somebody? And this study's honestly been done, and I, I mean no offense when they add this qualification, but after the first day they came in, they added the qualification, and it doesn't include lawyers. <laughs> I know that sounds like a lawyer joke, but apparently you can't, you can't kill, you can't, because many people get disused of lawyers and wish them dead. So it turns out, my, my favorite uncle is a lawyer, I nearly went to law school, but it's just, it sounds like a lawyer joke, but it's true. Lawyers really, anyway. Um, men have this a lot more than women. In fact, some women say, what do you mean? They wish somebody dead like they want to kill them? Well, well, guys say, you mean this week? <laughs> and I have to add that when the day that of 9-11, when these guys sent airplanes into the building, yep. the very, very first thing that popped into my head was this concept of revenge as a moral, just act. And, and I, I struggle with that because when, when we when society took away the moral judgment of these poor little Papua New Guinean men to be able to make their judgment, and then they said, no, you can't make those judgments anymore. 
I don't know that we can stop that in people. I think people, and so then when you say, okay, do you want to kill somebody? I'm thinking, well, sure, I get that. Because that was the ultimate revenge, was let's take them down where it hurts. And, and that was revenge, and how was that moral? So I get how they could think that was moral. And that was, no, and so that, that gets me back to normative. And now you've thrown in religion, so maybe that was religiously justifiable or something like that. So you're raising a lot of good points again. Um, so when I talk about morality and moral psychology, I mean that which people treat as moral and understand as moral, like, like the, the revenge-seeking mm -hmm. men. It might be, from a normative point of view, I'll step back and say that's not even moral. So for instance, one of the most moralized things in everyday life is uh, sexuality. And, and whether sort of, you know, the, the rules about, uh, about ages of people and the genders of people and so on. Now, somebody could come from a certain attitude and say, that's not moral at all. People should do whatever they want. And that itself is actually a moral claim. But regardless of whether you think people should think this way, our psychologies are highly moralistic with regard to sex. As for the other point, I agree with you about revenge. I think that there are appetites that we have, moral appetites, that are not going to be satisfied in a just society. And, you know, so what do we do? We've got movies. No, I, 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 I mean it. I mean it. You're, you know, somebody, um, somebody knocks over your mailbox. No, you can't kill him and his whole family. But go watch, uh, go watch one of those Captain America movies. Let us some steam. And, you know, and, and, and this is the story of civilization. I mean, I'm, I'm worried, in, in, in honor of the man who introduced me, get a quick a Freud citation, which, which is, which is that, you know, that, that civilization is always going to involve this tension between our evolved appetites and what we as rational beings um, want to do. If someone harmed one of my children, I'd want them tortured to death. But I could recognize that that may be bad policy. There's a talk to be given, which I'm not qualified to give, about the morality of gift giving and sort of malicious gift giving. This is malicious. Yeah. I could tell you stories about my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So. But, but it's true. If I give you something, now you're in my debt. And so you have to figure out complicated ways to refuse it without offending me further. So, oh, that's the worst. Yes, that's right. That's right. It sets up networks of obligation. No, the psychology of gifts is absolutely fascinating. Um, there's actually, so I know you're making the classic bag. I got, there's, a, there's a whole thing about what gifts are supposed to be as costly in time, which is why there's a whole psychology of why you can't give money to people. You know, so, oh, that was a wonderful dinner. Here's the 50. <laughs> that's horrible. Yeah, but what I could give you in some cases is a gift card. The gift card is an incredibly genius way of not giving money, but at the same time giving money. And anyway, extremely interesting stuff. Yes, thank, uh, thank you all.